Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I'm justified In Christ I live For in my place He died His robes for mine What cause have I for dread? God's daunting law Christ mastered in my stead Faultless I stand Righteous works not mine, saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cause. Jesus forsaken, God estranged from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. is crushed and thus the Father's peace. Christ drank God's wrath on sin and cried his time. Since which is made propitiation on. His robes for mine such anguish none can know. Christ God be Fullness of God. 
Nodding helpless babe This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live He lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. With the precious blood of Christ No guilt in life No fear in death This is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry To final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I Forgiven because you were forsaken, I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be? joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. of a multitude of those from every tribe and tongue we are your people redeemed by your blood rescued from death by your love there are no words good enough to thank you there are no Express my praise, but I will lift up my voice and sing from my heart with all of my strength. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, by the blood of Christ we stand. Every tongue, every tribe. Stand by grace.
grace in your presence, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. We are your children, called by your name. Humbly we bow and we pray. Release your power to work in us and through us till we are changed to be more like you. Then all the nations will see your glory revealed and worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah, hallelujah, by the blood of Christ we stand. Every tongue, every tribe, every people, every land, giving glory, giving honor. Giving praise unto the Lamb of God, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that you are Lord of all. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah, hallelujah, by the blood of Christ we stand. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for this day once again. In this unprecedented time, we can still breathe and we can still enjoy your glory in this world. Father, we ask of you this morning that as we worship you, may we truly worship you in spirit and truth. Guide us, O God. Prepare our hearts. But Lord, we would like to lift up to you all our cares, all our worries, and whatever is hindering our true worship to you, Lord God, take them away. Lord, we acknowledge our um, transgressions. We acknowledge, Father, our misdeeds, and we seek forgiveness from you. We thank you for your unending love, unending grace that you continue to extend to unworthy people like us. But Lord, we acknowledge that you are sovereign, you are gracious and merciful. And so we acknowledge also of what you have done for us. We thank you, Jesus, for obeying your heavenly Father without any hesitation. You send yourself to die on the cross, to pay the full penalty of our sins. O Holy Spirit, we thank you because you are always there to always enlighten us, encourage us, and lift us up, O God. Indeed, to give everything to the Father. And so, God, this morning, as we worship you, Lord, prepare our hearts. Be Allow us to be ready, whether it would be a good day or a bad day, a pro problematic day or not. Allow us, Lord, to have the peace that transcends all understanding, receiving whatever your will is for in our lives. And so this morning as we worship you, allow us to give our all to you. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and Amen. Our scripture reading for today is taken from the book of Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. 
Romans chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the feelings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore welcome one another, as Christ has welcomed you, for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness, in order to confirm the promise given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, and sing your name. And again it said, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the people extol him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Happy Lord's Day to everyone. When our athletes won all those medals in the recent Olympics, didn't we all share in the glory? It was a very welcome bit of good news in this time of bad news. What Filipino could not feel at least a little happy and proud at what they achieved? And because these athletes represented the Philippines, they made our country look good. They glorified the Philippines. Actually, it wasn't really even just about the medals, right? It was about their character. It was about their actions that they showed on the global stage. And if anyone acted badly there in the Olympics, they would have made their country look bad. Now I have a question. Do you make God look good? Does our church, does UECG make God look good? Because we are also on a stage, we are also on display. People see us, look at our actions, and they could see something about God from that. Do we make God look good? So do we glorify Him? What is God's glory? How do we even give glory to God? You know, Romans 14 and 15 have been telling us to be a welcoming and loving church. You know, we've been talking about that for the past weeks. But I believe Paul is saying here in chapter 15 that we need to have this right view of God's glory first. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about God's glory first. And closely related to that is hope. And I hope to convince you that this is necessary for UECG to be a welcoming church. Now, what does what does glory and hope have to do with Christian unity and love? Notice how Paul brings it up. So in essence, Paul is telling us here in this passage that we can't truly love each other without having hope in God's glory first. Romans 15, 7 gives us our main command for today. We welcome each other as Christ welcomed us for the glory of God. What I hope today is to convince you that we cannot welcome each other without knowing what hope in God's glory is. And we cannot hope in God's glory without understanding what Jesus did for us. Only then will we try to define what welcoming each other might mean for UECG. So the glory of God are these qualities of God that are so majestic and awesome and and big and wonderful that we cannot even find the words to describe it properly. Now we can only imagine what it would be like someday when we'll be in His presence. God is infinitely good and powerful and loving and just and knowing. And to glorify God is to point people to how good He is. Think about it this way. In 1 Corinthians 5.20, it says that we are ambassadors of Christ. And that means what we do reflects on God. So what we do could result in someone knowing more about God. Or what we do could result in someone praising God. So that is how we glorify God. You know, on the flip side of it, 
what we do could make someone think less of God as well. And that is the opposite of glorifying God. But we have to be careful here, especially in our culture. We might have this emphasis on looking good, on, on pretending that we are okay. Now, that is one of the weaknesses of our Asian culture. So we're not talking about performing here or pretending that we are so faithful, we are so good, that we are so blessed uh, to somehow make others have a good impression of us and God. That's not what we're talking about. And I don't think that even works in the long run. But um, sinners like us can make God look good through what God has shown and did in our lives. Now, first and foremost, we can glorify God as sinners when our lives are are transformed by the gospel when we first receive Him as Lord and Savior. So when people see that transformation we have, it's not talking about perfection, it is about being transformed because we are sinners and we have known the glory and the grace of God when we put our faith in Jesus. We glorify God through that. And then secondly, when when we walk in walk with Jesus, when we grow in our faith, when people see that, that our lives are uh, it's being literally transformed, you know, day by day, moment by moment, we glorify God as well. So it is not about perfection or pretending that we are this perfect Christian. No one is. There's a certain level of vulnerability required here where you have to let people in. You have to let people see what is real and see that God is good, not necessarily us. And so they would glorify God. So it means that letting people know that truly we are only sinners saved by grace. Now what does hope have to do with this? Hope used in this passage does not mean wishful thinking. It is not used in the sense that I hope it will not rain or I hope my food will be yummy. That is not the hope that is used here. You know, hope here is this confident assurance that something will happen. No, you are sure. It is not wishful thinking. You are sure this would happen. Hope here means that we believe in it with all our heart and are willing to put our lives on the line that someday we will be with God's glory precisely because of the gospel. It means you are so sure that we will be with our glorious God because of what Jesus said. That is the hope that is talked about here. There are other kinds of hope, of course. We hope for other things. But no other kind of hope can actually make Christians unite. So we're not saying the other types of hope is bad. No, Romans 5 2 does say though that faith, our faith results in us having hope in the glory of God above all other hope that means. So we might be hoping for prosperity. We might be hoping for a safe, uh, for safety, for security for our families. We have dreams we want to achieve and none of those are bad things of course it's good to do to do those but but this passage is implying the whole of romans honestly is that the hope in the glory of god is above all those things so in this part you know you can do a little reflection uh, it, it actually shows in our actions in our decisions what is your greatest hope if our greatest hope is actually just prosperity and and safety it shows in our decisions in our financial decisions, in our how we decide on things, how we weigh things. But if our hope is in the glory of God someday, it actually changes things. Now, if we're honest about it, I think on some level at least, we are not really fond or we don't like the idea of glorifying God. You know why this is? Because I think even the most selfless humans will actually have selfish desires. This is what it means right now to be human, to be fallen in nature. And that means we would want also to glorify ourselves. Isisingit natin yung glory natin kahit saan. We want to make ourselves look good. And usually, think about this, we are all actually okay with making God look good as long as we also look good at the same time. The moment that we don't, Ah, nandun na yung, nandun na yung problema. Okay? If, if, uh, the results of our actions, think about this, is that people praise us mainly. You know, it doesn't result to the praise of God. You know, i-reflect yung mga ginagawa natin as a Christian, even the ministry we're doing. If it, if it just results in people praising us, 
where we have to think hard and think think really deep if we are really glorifying God. But I am telling you, it is normal for selfish humans to want to glorify ourselves. Romans 14 and 15, especially last week, you know, we've been talking about uh, how Christians can be united in Christ. And Paul had to say that precisely because the Christians then had selfish desires. That led them to disagreements. That led them to convictions that aren't necessarily sin, but because they were selfish, it led them to not love their fellow Christians. It's the same for us. Now, these are convictions that the Bible does not really require Christians to do anymore, but, um, but they, had, they felt very, very strongly about it, and so they judged each other. Think about what these two chapters require us to do. Romans 14 and 15. Isn't it to surrender our rights? Do not judge, do not cause anyone to stumble, to bear with weaknesses, to welcome each other, uh, honestly means that there is something you have to give up. That leads us to intentionally not giving ourselves glory, to not making ourselves look good for the sake of making God look good. And that is hard to do for selfish people. To, ob to obey these commands is, is going to be very, very hard. But what these two chapters are telling us, no matter what, Christians should be united. Unity, I think, may be a more important, important concept, a more important command than what we realized before. This whole uh, passage is telling us, Romans 14 and 15, in a sense, if we are not united, we are not glorifying God. And if we are not glorifying God, it means we could have caused people, when they look at us, when they look at our church, think less of God. Can you feel the gravity of that offense, of that effect? The, the effect could be eternal. And it should make us pause and think about the actions that we're doing as a Christian and inside our church. The Christian faith is actually centered on God's glory. The Bible reveals that God does all that he does for his own glory. But it's not selfish on God's part, which we might be thinking um, naturally. You know, because for God, there's no other better, there's no better motivation than that. There's no higher cause than his glory. He's already the best in the universe. What else could God glorify but himself? In fact, when God shows us his glory, reveals his glory to us, he's giving us his best. But again, as selfish people, we will inevitably try to, to, to sneak in our own uh, glory. You know, even the, the way we think about the gospel can be tainted with self-glory. Think about it. Um, it is true, of course, that God sent his own son uh, to die on, for our sins because he loved us. That is true. That is what the Bible says. Um, but the more important reason which I don't know if you've thought about it or if you've read about it, is that God did it more for his glory. The more important reason is that God did everything for his own glory. See passages such as John 17. Um, God did this for his glory. Jesus came for his glory. Do we recoil a little at, at hearing that? Are we uncomfortable at that? You know, the idea that someone loved us so much to die, enough to die for us, is actually music to our ears. It makes us feel the like the center of the universe, right? It makes us feel good, and of course, that's natural. But to hear that God actually considers his own glory far more, far more than that, far more than us, is a little bit uncomfortable to hear. Isaiah 43.7 goes even further than that to say that God created us for His own glory. Hindi pala tayo yung bida. So, yikes. But it is true. It is true God's big purpose is to glorify Himself. That does not mean, of course, that God does not love us. He does love us. In fact, it is because He loves us that He has shown us His glory. Kaso hindi tayo yung bida, okay? Ito tayo, ito si God. That is the reality. And sometimes that is very, very hard for us to accept. 
Now, that is our big purpose, to glorify God so that His name would be praised among all the nations. That is the purpose of the church. You know, I think as you walk with Jesus and you grow in your faith, you, you realize this more and more. You know, at first, it's hard to accept it. But the more you see of God's glory and how good it is, the more all these other concerns, all these other hopes that we have will actually fade in comparison to that. And so, uh, UCG, do you think our church makes God look good? I am hoping, I am hoping that, that when someone visits us, someone attends, even this online service we have, even the Zoom calls, it will result to people glorifying God. And that is my prayer for this church. So we needed to have this right view of God's glory before understanding why unity is such a big deal. On a surface level, all the commandments from Romans 14 to 15 probably make sense to us. So what are these? Don't judge each other. Have patience with each other. The strong bear the weaknesses of the weak. Welcome each other. You know, we all agree these are nice ideals. I don't think anyone really disagrees with that. But I think it's impossible to live it out consistently unless we have the glory of God as our biggest hope. We will likely set all these nice ideals apart the moment that someone irritates us, someone offends us, when you are so disappointed with someone. Madali na itabi ang mga welcome, welcome each other na yan. Um, but because we're naturally selfish, I think these moments actually occur a lot, quite often. Paul says in Romans 14 that the Roman believers were disagreeing, arguing about stuff like holy days and food that, that they can or cannot eat. He does not explicitly say it in the letter, but I believe Paul was talking about disagreements between mainly Jewish and Gentile believers. The Jewish believers could possibly have been trying to hold on to a lot of uh, traditions and Old Testament uh, laws that were not bad, were not sin, but now unnecessary because of the freedom that they have in Christ, because it is a new covenant. So they judged the ones who felt more free, and they wanted them to have the same mindset as them. And the strong uh, had the problem of looking down on, on having these uh, weaker believers in contempt. Last week, Reverend uh, Mike talked about the importance then of loving each other, of giving up our rights for the sake of unity. So today is a continuation of that idea. And verse 1, 2, and 7 gives us the commands to follow here. So the strong bear with the weak, we please other people, we welcome each other. We'll explain that in more detail later, but it's actually very, fairly straightforward. But this is what I was bringing up earlier. Is it not unusual that the reason Paul gives so that we can do these things is the hope in God's glory? Verse 3, if you look at it, it's actually what we might expect to hear. You know, it, Jesus did not please himself, but pleased other people. And so we can follow the example of Jesus. Um, the line about Jesus taking on the reproaches of others is a quote from Psalm 69.9. So reproach means the insults, the scorn, the venom of other people. In essence, Jesus um, took on all of these things, did not... Um, the suffered, we're willing to suffer all these things for the sake of serving other people. And of course, it's good to follow the example of Jesus. But then, Paul goes further to say in verse 4, the scriptures teach us endurance and encouragement and makes us hope. So think about it, no? but, but biglang nandito yung, yung scriptures. What does that have to do with unity? His prayer in verse 5 tells us that harmony, you know, living with each other, is something that God grants that is supernatural. Something possible only from the God who, who gives endurance and encouragement. Why does scripture lead to hope? Because scripture points God. It reveals God's glory. In scripture, we see the gospel. And the gospel is what allows us to be with God to see God's glory. 
That's what you get when you truly read God's word. It is hope in the glory of God. That is why we, we always tell our disciples, right? You, you read the Bible. When you lead people, when you take care of people, when you mentor people, it is, it is, of course, we give them what we can, our, our wisdom, our care, and, and, and whatever we can give them. But you cannot give them what Scripture offers them because only Scripture reveals the glory of God. So this is an encouragement to all of us. Read it because Scripture results in hope. Paul further explains that Scripture reveals everything Jesus did gives us hope. In verse 8, it says that he was born in Israel to confirm the promises that were in the Old Testament. It results in not just Israel, but the Gentiles glorifying God. And he gives four Old Testament quotations in the next verses. Psalm 18.49, Deuteronomy 32.43, Psalm 117.1, and Isaiah 11.10 confirms that Jesus came so that we Gentiles will glorify God for his mercy. Now notice Paul's prayer in verse 13. He prays again that God will give us hope. Because that is what it takes to become a loving church. Do you see the pattern? Scripture reveals the glory of God and the gospel. The gospel connects us to God's glory and gives us hope. Hope in God's glory gives us the ability to give up our rights for the sake of loving people. It is hard to be a loving church. In our church, we can disagree about a lot of stuff. Should Christians be allowed to drink and smoke? Is a certain type of music more acceptable in our services? C can we eat food, you know, just like the Roman Christians before? Can we eat food that was offered on altars, on Chinese altars? You know, is, is dressing our best uh, on Sunday a way to honor God? shorts ka? Okay lang you know, what, What's the best way to disciple? What's, what are programs we should focus on? You know, our disagreements can range from the mundane to the major. We all have different answers to that and different emotional reactions. For some of these disagreements, we actually don't mind at all. But some of these topics uh, will actually enrage us when we don't get our way. How many of us have had this idea in our minds? You know, I, I will, I, I want to leave this church. I will leave this church if this or that does not happen or happens. If I don't get my way. Think about think about what that means. You know, for me, I, I had I, it wasn't just an idea, but I actually did it. You know, I, I said in my last last message that none of us can look at each other on a moral high ground because we have all sinned. And here I cannot also. I actually did it. I, I went to another church. I attended uh, a leadership small group because I felt that the church was not providing me with what I needed and what I wanted. But now. Well, God brought me back. Pagbalik ko, pastor na ako. So, huwag na kayong ng church. But kidding aside, um, I realized I did not glorify God through my actions. I, I don't think uh, my actions caused someone to praise God. In one sense, it was a little bit div divisive. So, it's hard. It's hard, right? When the idea of loving people, staying united, um, especially when you disagree, gets hard. The only thing, the only thing, this passage tells us to look to Jesus first, to be able to do it. Hope in the glory of God is what enables us to truly love each other. Why is that? Why? Do, how? What does that look like in action? Because it is a giving up of our rights for the sake of others. So that God is glorified. And if your hope is in the glory of God, literally, then what can you give up that is worse than that? That is better than the hope in the glory of God. That is how, that is how we can uh, put into perspective the disagreements that we have. Now, let's tackle this a little bit uh, more specifically. Now, what, what does bearing with the failings of the weak look like? Remember that the weak does not have anything to do actually with ability or talent. But rather, if someone, because of their faith, believes that they need to obey a tradition that scripture does not really require us to do. 
Now for the Romans, it was about food and holy days. And I said earlier, it could be the same for, for us. You know, uh, uh, music, laws, eating food, uh, etc. Could be about, um, you know, convictions that aren't sin. Oh, hindi man talaga mali. But our faith might not allow us to do it because our conscience is bothering us. Now, we may have different convictions on these things, um, but is, these are issues that arise from different interpretations of scripture and different cultural backgrounds. Okay, if we are uh, strong, that means we recognize our, our freedom in Christ. But if we are weak in some areas, we, we want to impose our weaknesses on others, our mindsets, our, our convictions. Now, Sometimes it's gonna be very tough, if, especially for commanded to support, to bear. That word bear means continuously support. It's not a one-time thing. It's not tolerate. It is to support, to love that person. Now, to give you a simple but plausible scenario, suppose you are out with friends. Suppose you have limited time and you just want to have fun. And what if the thing you really want to do is to watch a particular movie? Everyone has been waiting for that movie. Now the movie does not have uh, does not have explicit sex scenes, and you know that you your conscience allows you to watch these things. You you feel that your faith is fine. But what we, what if you have one friend who does not feel comfortable, whose conscience is bad? So what does loving that bearing with the weakness of that person, loving that person, look like? Is it to uh to to watch? with your friends, leave that person alone, or be with that person, do something else even though you don't really want to do anything else. Can you do it without resentment, without without making that person look bad? What if you have a conviction that you can actually listen to any music that you want? But you have a friend who has this conviction that we should only listen to Christian music. What does loving that person look like? What does it look like for you to bear with that, the weakness of that person? So I believe whatever our, our decision would be, to love the person, to bear with the weakness, means a giving up of our rights, even if we are convinced that we are actually right. It means that we do not, do not respond with anger, resentment, or mockery. We do not attack them, we support them. So it is a decision to lovingly give up our rights for their sake. And you can only do this, honestly, I believe you can only do this consistently if you are hoping in the glory of God. Because we will reach our limit. Maybe sometimes for the people that you like, you can do this. But to do this to everyone is going to be hard. You can do it because whatever rights you give up for the glory of God cannot compare cannot compare. What is it that you're giving up that can compare with the glory of God? UECG, I believe we are called to bear with each other's weaknesses, especially because we have different convictions. What does it look like to please each other? It is actually similar to, to what Paul just said earlier about bearing with the weak, but now the command is referring not just to strong and weak anymore. This is everyone. All of us are commanded to not please ourselves, but to please others. To build up other people, to do what is good for them. Now, I don't think anyone here disagrees with that idea. If you're a de decent human being, I think you, you're okay with doing good for other people. But we have our limits. If we're, if we're honest about ourselves, we're actually selective. Okay, and we do it in moderation. Okay, we do it with people we like and love. But this passage is, is not talking about that. This is for everyone. You know, Paul is saying here the church should be a place where people, the members are increasingly less concerned about themselves, but on the benefit of other people. Hirap uh, uh, Of course, it is legitimate for us to be concerned about our needs. To be a loving church means to sometimes defer and think about the other person. And again, you can only do this if your greatest hope, your needs are actually fulfilled because you have that hope in the glory of God. Think about 
Think about your last interaction with someone in our church. Did you seek their good? What would it look like to come to a conversation intentionally planning to actually bless that other person, to seek their good? It could mean just as simple as praying for them, following up on them, okay? being with them, offer a word of encouragement, or whatever service you need to do for that person. That is what it means to please each other. And again, you can do it only if your needs are fulfilled because your hope is in the glory of God. Ganun ka confident yung assurance mo that Jesus actually did everything already. And you will be with God someday. Now, of course, I'm not implying that you ignore your needs. In fact, we should take care of each other. That is what this passage is implying. But be honest, we, we, we tend to look only at our own needs and not others. So this passage is telling us to be a loving church means to look to others. What would it look like to welcome each other for the glory of God? Are we a welcoming church? I, I think we have ushers who greet people, at least pre-pandemic, to come into our services. We exchange, of course, pleasantries with a lot of people inside the church. And I think that's good. I think it's part of what welcoming each other means. But that is the shallow level only. It is just being polite to each other. It can actually go a lot deeper than that. To welcome each other means to intentionally go out of your way to accept, love, and support other people. And again, there is no qualification. This is everyone. Okay? Hindi lang kabarkada natin, hindi lang yung, yung, uh, hindi lang, hindi lang yung crush natin, hindi lang yung mga taong uh, lagi natin nakakasama, but this is everyone, even if you don't like them. Be honest, there are people in church you don't like. But we have to welcome each other still for the glory of God. Could be letting people into your life, into your home. It is to spend time with them. It is to seek their good. Welcoming each other is an active thing. It is not just, nakita mo, bumati ka, welcome. You know, that, that's not it. It is an intentional thing. It means a certain level of vulnerability, again, to let people into your life. And I know that is hard in our culture, which is very, um, uh, very concerned about privacy. You know, we want, we want to be left alone. But to welcome each other implies that we have to, uh, connect and engage with other people. Of course, you cannot practically do that with every single person in church. But we are called to welcome who we can. I want to take this time to actually encourage us, those of us who do not have that small group yet, come, come, be in fellowship. You know, I, we're, I, I don't want to say also that small group is the only real way to do fellowship. When we talk about discipleship, uh, discipleship is a broad term that covers everything we're doing in church. Should be discipleship to point us to Jesus, whether we're singing, we're serving, whatever we're doing, right? And small group, I believe, is actually a very, very good way for us to uh, be discipled in the form of connecting with, with each other, in welcoming each other. We learn how to obey this command, to welcome each other, to bear with each other's weaknesses. And I know for some of us, it's uncomfortable to, you know, engage with people in that sense, to be vulnerable to other people. That, but that is how you grow. Um, I believe you are uh, missing out on a lot of things. Of course, to be part of a small group, to be part, to be in fellowship with other people, uh, entails, of course, a, a level of, of sacrifice, time, money, resources, you know, all of those. But the benefit you get, uh, is, is, is greater than that. It, it, it is for the glory of God. And it is for your good. So I wanna, I wanna encourage you, come connect to people. I just want to see what it is, then let us know. Now, I want to share something that can be helpful as we try to figure out how we can be more united in UECG. This is from an article called Gospel Levels, Gospel Unity rather, and Levels of Certainty by Dr. Jerry Breshears. It is a suggestion on how we can think of potentially divisive issues here. And he is saying we can actually divide them into four levels depending on how sure are we with each of the issues. I'll be posting the link in our groups as well so you can read the article. I think it's a, it's a good article, but let me explain it quickly. First, there are issues that we die for. 
there are certain faith issues that we should be willing to defend with everything that we have. Even to the point of dying for them. That is how important they are. This is about gospel message, the things that are essential to salvation. It includes the character of God, the identity of Jesus, the trustworthiness of scripture. Now, if we allow disagreement here, just for the sake of unity, the consequences can be eternal. So we will not compromise this just for the sake of unity. There are issues that are to die for. There are issues also to divide for. Now, this, there's, this could be some theological disagreements that are major enough to consider just separating into different congregations. There is still fellowship because we can consider each other fellow believers, brothers, and sisters. But the disagreement about certain things can make it hard to do things as a church. It could be issues like uh, infant baptism, spiritual gifts, how the church is structured. Not really about salvation or about who God is, but about interpretation of certain commands. So it isn't necessarily sin issues, but it does affect how we do things in church. So it makes sense to just divide into different local congregations, but still in fellowship with each other. But honestly, most issues we disagree with will probably not be these. It won't be to die for, it won't be to divide for. Thirdly, then the is- there are issues that we just debate for. You know, these are agreements, disagreements that are not central to our faith, then we can actually just discuss, but stay in one. Church, a lot of our issues fall under these. It can be emotional, usually in fact, and painful to discuss this with our churchmates. But they are issues that justify, cannot justify dividing the church and breaking the fellowship. We can debate issues um, like musical styles, discipleship strategy, uh, even the budget, how we spend the budget. Uh, We shouldn't silence these debates just to avoid confrontation. Um, It is healthy for us to do this in a loving manner, but it shouldn't break the fellowship. Think about it. A lot of the things we are passionate about could actually fall under these. Hindi naman ganun ka major, hindi naman talaga about salvation, but about things we feel very strongly about. The last one, fourthly, there are issues to decide for. Now, if an issue is really non-essential and very, very minor, sometimes we don't even need to debate. You can just follow whatever. Because there is no biblical command for it, it is not that important, so it means even if we disagree, we can just accommodate the other person. Because it does not affect the gospel, does not affect the ministry anyway. Now, I personally am hoping that as I grow more mature, a lot of my debate issues, I still have a lot of those, will be downgraded to this. A lot of them have already been downgraded to decide for. Because it turns out that it's not important and I can just not care about it anyway. Now, we will all categorize issues differently. What may be a decide for issue for me may be a debate for or even divide for issue for you. But the principles we learned in these two chapters, especially today about unity and love and hope in the glory of God, will hopefully help us downgrade a lot of our disagreements. Okay, sana bumaba talaga yan hanggang decide for na lang. Okay, there is a time to divide, to divide, to disagree uh, strongly about issues that affect the gospel story and issues of sin. But for the sake of making God look good, I believe we can give up our rights on issues that uh, are not as major and just pursue unity. It may mean we may need to accept the inconvenience, the hassle, the cost, of giving up those rights, but we can do it if our real and ultimate hope is on the glory of God. UECG, let's welcome each other. God bless you. So our benediction for today is actually taken from the passage itself. It was Paul's prayer for the Roman Christians. It is my prayer for us as well. Let us receive the benediction. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing 
so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray this. Amen. Simply resting in